Hello and uh, welcome to this week's work. Um, we're going to be focusing on the, starting the second half of the class. We're going to go over some speech requirement stuff as well. Um, reminder of speech pattern. We're going to actually do that first. And then we'll have the participation hidden um, in the video, just like always, and then put it in the comments uh, on Canvas uh, for those sweet, sweet, easy participation points. Um, let's go ahead and uh, do this. Oh, I'm not at Southgate this week because I'm on spring break. Um, so, uh, so you actually are seeing this from my office at home. I have a door that I never use, so I block it off with my project table. And that artwork there is just covering up my dry erase board that has what I'm working on in my projects and so forth. Um, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, you can see my degrees. This hand, this my degrees are over here. Uh, let's see what else is there. I uh, remember um, I talk a lot about the importance of nonverbal communication. When I'm when I'm at um, on video at home, I'm giving a lot of nonverbal stuff off um, and so forth. Like I use uh, Legos for mental health, my own personal mental health. So you'll see Lego sets. I'm actually working on something right there. There you go. Uh, let's see uh, my books. Uh, some people ask me why I still like physical media. I love having a library and so my soft cover books are in uh, in the garage now I'm very nicely kept i'm bringing out my hardcover collection this one hey my hardcover collection and then i move my my little still book movies so yeah so, woo -woo -woo. the visual i give in and uh if we were doing synchronized meetings online there would be a lot more to this and you would hear stuff all the way. Oh, wait a second. That's right, we have the fire mag. Oh, before I go, I, I always, uh, when I do videos at home, I always have two uh, music uh, records to demonstrate things maybe you heard, like uh, the Flash Gordon soundtrack, very important to me. Uh, my theme song is the, is the theme song for that. And, and then uh, James Brown record. Uh, the, uh, I, I love James Brown, I love so much. Uh, but I have the Fire Academy um, um, in this class. I said I was going to bring stuff. I don't have to bring stuff. I have stuff here. So let me see this real quick. So let me go grab something else, too. Uh, but yes. Uh, so I'll just show this off, and then we'll start the, the lecture. I never used it. I just thought it was funny to grab it. All right. Um, all right. So uh, this is my uh, uh, my my firefighter gear, uh, gear is all downstairs. Um, whatever I still have left, like my wildfire pants, my my uh, uh, uniform from the for a rescue but here is my uh cover uh for when i was in yosemite the firefighter in, in yosemite and i even still have my patch uh, if you ever get onto the fire department patch collecting is a big thing um i actually once seen and the that fire department used to own because it's a very revered um hatch and so we got patches from around the world um, and someone stole the most sought after fire patch which is the George Lucas uh, patch um, but I've, I've seen it but the Millennium Falcon it was huge and someone I think stole it because the last time I visited it was off the wall um, and then this is from the military time crash fire rescue the bib thing I had this with my COVID stuff because I thought it would be a hilarious master I know it worked during the mass time, but yeah, all right. So enough about that stuff. Uh, let's get into the work and uh, so forth. But I just thought since it's my, like the only time you guys are gonna see my workplace, usually this is where I film online classes. Might as well show it around. All right. Um, all right, let's keep going. Uh, let's first start off with your 
speech, speech requirement. And so to do so, I am going to share screen and have the slide for the informative speech up. So the informative speech, just to let you know, um, same, I, we already went through the requirements in class, but just a reminder, it's five minute speech, outline, 15 minutes, evaluation question, 10 minutes, just like last time, same outline, same outline. Now you just have a little extra page, 75 points for the speech. Um, and then here's all the things I talked about. Informative speech about an issue, has to be neutral, uh, non-biased, non-judgmental. Topical issue, recommend macro subject, something that is relevant. But it's a fun speech, meaning that you can talk about serious issues, but there are students who talk about hobbies, favorite foods, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, something that you can research, all right? So you might, there might be a celebrity that's really popular right now and, and relevant, or maybe a new musical act that just broke out, but there's probably no research on it. Um, PowerPoint, three slides, we talked about this. By the way, um, for this part of the class, um, this will probably be the only time I go through the chapters on online because I'm gonna put the research workshop and the visual aid workshop online and do the chapters in class. And the reason why is because that way, I think I already told you in class already, that we can go back to it, all right? Uh, PowerPoint three slides, uh, we'll cover that. Three references cited in uh, speech and outline, we'll cover that as well on the research workshop, APA. Recommend business schedule, that's a holdover from when I taught this class at Cal State LA, which they were more uh, adamant about what you wear uh, to the speech. And we were actually supposed to give like bonus points if people dressed up. Um, and so, um, but it's not here. We I always recommend don't you don't have to dress business casual, but uh, always try to you know don't be too sloppy. And I always tell students don't ever wear anything like you know I'm I like I'm wearing this right here, my sweatshirt because I didn't want to you know I didn't want to just I just threw something on. But if I was giving a speech or uh, or so forth, um, I would try not to have clothes that people would read stuff. Because uh, you'd rather have them hearing your speech or focus on your PowerPoint than trying to read your shirt or figure it out. People would be saying, why does he have a 50 years of hip hop shirt? Because I was at the event, folks. I was at the event. Um, uh, so yeah, evaluation, same as last time, except there's three new questions. Uh, questions always change, but the comments on the sections don't change. Same as last time uh, with the outline, except now you re you're actually going to use that reference page at the end. Uh, again, we'll cover that later. Uh, just a reminder: if you have or you have not turned in your outline or evaluation for the first speech, make sure you turn it in. Uh, you have until the last day to drop, which is May fifth, to turn that stuff in. Same thing with the speech and the midterm. Make sure we actually the midterm and the speech. Let's get that all that stuff finished. Uh, next week, um, but I don't think there's any outside speeches, but um, the first stuff is due, um, the latest you can turn it in is the last day to drop, because if you haven't done that stuff by the last day you drop, then you might think about using the last day to drop to drop. All right, uh, I think that's everything. Uh, let's move on. Uh, oh, I might have to go grab Probably won't have to grab Chapter 22, chapter 22, um, Oh yeah, let me go back. Actually, let me go back. Let me go back. Uh, let's talk about speech, and I'll actually give your participation at this time. So, um, first off, there are four um, four uh, different um, uh, types of speech patterns you can choose. We talked about it in class. But just a reminder, the four, and you can look up the book, it's from the first half of the class, but a topical speech pattern, which is, I'll cover this more in a second, but it's just like choose your own adventure. You get to choose your own three main points and so forth. I'll talk I'll talk to you in a second about how to do it. Uh, chronological, you can use chronological. You already done a chronological speech. You can't repeat the speech pattern, so you can't do past, present, future. But a lot of students will do chronological. It's an easy one to do. And if you're doing a historical thing, um, 
you would do like starting point, midpoint, current point, main point one, main point two, main point three. Just starting point or whatever you're talking about, midpoint, and then the end point, which is the current day. All right. So that's a very popular one. And remember, chronological is how you explain how to bake a cake, how to cook things as well, how to put things together. Uh, let's see. A uh, the third one is spatial. Spatial is considered the weird uh, oddest one. It has to do with physical location. But if you were doing any kind of road trip speech or a speech about Sherman's uh, um, march to Atlanta during the Civil War, or if you were doing anything like the the physical makeup of a cell or a castle. Uh, it would be spatial because the physical location. So remember, remember that one as well. Uh, let's see. Um, what else is there? And last but not least, and the one that students use the least is cause and effect because it's very close. It's a, it's a very, it's used more for persuasion because uh, cause and effect is very good about uh, changing people's minds. But you can't do that for the speech. So cause and effect, some students have used it to explain like, you know, like scientific stuff or his things in history, like why it occurred, stuff like that. Uh, but the most popular one is topical and I told you I was gonna cover it again. Um, it's choose your own adventure, but there has to be a natural flow to it. And what I mean by that is like, I had students like a simple to complex type speech where a student did a speech about yoga and they did main point one, Level one yoga, main point two, level two yoga, main point three, level three yoga. Meaning simple, um, harder, hardest levels of uh, yoga. Um, that's that's a natural flow to it. Or when people do speeches about pets and like how to um, raise, uh, let's say ferrets, all right? And, um, and so you would do a speech about, you know, like, uh, the different types of ferrets, you know, where, where, where they come from. Um, and second would be like the laws because there are, there are restrictions, every restrictions on ferrets, the laws and everything you need to know for the requirements of owning a ferret. And then number three, what you need physically need to have the ferret, you know, like the food and stuff. That's a natural flow to it, right? That's a natural flow. But if you did a speech about ferrets and like in the middle of it, instead of that natural flow, you did talk about predators of ferrets. You're talking about raising ferrets, right? You're right. You're not usually that's indoors or in a confined space, and so you might do like predators of ferrets in a speech about ferrets in the wild, but not. And you see how that natural flow takes place. So it's like a natural rhythm to it, you know, natural way. Uh, about it and so if it's if it's like two of the main points are similar and one is like what, what why is you putting why are you trying to shove that in there then it just might mean that you are maybe running out of things or something. i don't but it's it's it, it it throws you off so if you use topical which is the most popular form of informative speech is the one students use the most Make sure there's a natural form to and natural flow. And you can always talk to me. You can always, you know, I always recommend just talking to me before or after class on that. All right. Or when we do, you know, like uh, participation time and you just raise your hand and I'll come up. Uh, let's see what else is there. Um, yeah. So have that kind of stuff in there. All right. Today's participation. Um, there. Remember, after this video goes up, um, I'm also posting the sign up list for your topics. Um, so that's one participation, but that was already addressed in class. You already know that's coming. For this video, the participation below uh, for the in the comments, in the replies, is to um, keyword outline your speech. So post the topic and then post the three keywords, only one word each for your main point one, main point two, main point three. So if I was doing a speech, um, I'll use one of the band speeches since no student can do it. Uh, if I was doing a speech on the cartels, right? 
um, then I might do a, um, a topical speech, or no, I'll do a history speech um, about a, a chronological speech about it. So I talk about um, the rise of Colombia cartels, um, the switch to Mexican cartels, and then three where we find ourselves today. Right, that's a that's a good easy chronological speech, and I would put Colombia. I would say cartels, topic cartels, main point one, Colombia, main point two, Mexico, main point three, today, right? Keywords, just keywords, natural flow. So it, it's a good way to plan and per, um, for your speech. And then also five easy points for you, okay? So you might even put what kind of speech pattern you're using to help yourself out. All right, and look at each other's um, answers and give feedback to each other uh, when you guys are working in study groups and so forth. All right, let's move on. Today's participation. Okay, so um, chapter 22, um, it's a, uh, we skip it around here. Chapter 22 is about um, informative speaking. Um, there are three terms. The first two are not on the test. That is speech to inform. Anytime you're giving a speech about where, where you're telling people about a subject and you're not trying to push them into anything, you know, it's neutral in nature, non-biased, unbiased, then it's speech to just inform. You're just telling about a subject. Um, there's more to it. Look it up. But most important thing for you guys to remember is neutral. And, and you're trying to inform. Topical issue, right? It could be a fun subject. It could be a serious subject. But it's neutral, not trying to change any minds or, or behavior. And uh, I always say and drag or or something like that. Don't worry, it's not on the test. It's how do you teach adults? And if you, you have access to the book, and I we talked about how to get the book where you don't have to pay for it, I'm not gonna put it on video. Um the book has a nice little thing in it that gives you techniques on how to uh, teach adults. And you're wondering, why do I need to know that? Because you're gonna do that in your future. You're gonna have to teach adults. Every job I've ever had, I pretty much have trained people in some way or another. And those people have been adults. Heck, when I was your age, uh, and I was a, a volunteer coordinator for a political, coordinated political campaign. And I was training adults on how to do, you know, go door to door and stuff. So how to train adults is a very important subject, not needed for the test or this class, but it's probably something you need for your future. So look it over just real quick. Uh, word picture is going to be on the test. It's a, it's a possible answer on the test. Word picture is anytime you put a mental image through your description, your explanation, that triggers people's senses. It's very important. Senses, that's the key word there. Word picture equals senses. And the reason why you want to remember that is word picture do, giving someone a mental image with your words that goes after your senses is probably one of the easiest ways to trigger a, a positive response or whatever response you want. Because uh, the senses are just a very basic, basic, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a basic like need. It's a basic um, remote, uh, a, a response. Because, I mean, when we hear cave people, you know, you, you hunger, you need to eat, triggers your senses of, uh, of taste and then your smell and so forth and your sight to get that food to survive, right? And so anytime you can trigger that basic need, the basic animalistic, that's the word I'm trying to go for. It's animalistic response, meaning something that's biological in nature. It's connected to your mind through your, you know, through whatever your senses are. Um, then it's you're gonna get you're gonna find out that it's gonna give you an easier response than you, you would believe. And if you don't believe me, just think about any kind of ads. I don't. You guys are younger, so maybe you don't have to deal with radio ads like, like uh, us old folks do. But I mean, there's there's a lot of these streaming services have radio uh, ads uh, on it. Um, 
Um, but if like when they talk about food, they're trying to trigger your your sense of taste or maybe smell. Um, or they're talking about um, you know, going on adventures, you know, going to this site and you're gonna see these amazing things. Obviously, that's sight. Or are they talking about staying at a hotel with our comfy beds? That's obviously touch. And, and it goes on to even television ads, the things that you see. A lot of times they go out to your senses. And one of the ways you know that is because there's this phrase, and I, and I know high school teachers have talked about it because I've heard about it in marketing classes at high school where teachers will say the phrase sex sells. And um, and so they use attractive people in the ads. Well, those things, emotion, uh, emotion, um, since you know, sight, ooh, desire, um, touch, ooh, where they, they, ooh, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So, then, the, 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 you know, like, ooh, uh, you know, I like the hold hands. There you go, the high school version. Um, but the fact of the matter is that's very animalistic, primal. Um, and so going, making a mental image in someone's head with your descriptions, it hits their senses. It's a very good strategy. All right, let's keep it going. Goals of informative speaking, uh, informative speech. Your book covers three things, and they're very true. Um, you want people to understand. So I'm going to take a topic from my wall here. I used to live around bears when I was in Yosemite National Park. And so if I was giving a speech about the time I lived in Yosemite National Park and about everything you need to know about bears, maybe because I want people to understand that there are certain rules when you're around wild animals. And trust me, I um, I saw it firsthand and how big people are so ignorant. And one time I saw a parent put their young child, not, not too young, but old enough to have a response. And I started cussing out very loudly this parent and and they were like, how oh, dare you cuss in front of my kids? And then I explained to them very loudly, very horribly, you're going to put that kid at risk of dying. That's how people die in this park. And the kid looked up at the dad like, are you an idiot? <laughs> but that's an informing speech right there, right? I want people to understand what it's like to live around actually these dangerous animals. Um, we live around, we live in places where coyotes, you know, can you can see coyotes where I live in Alhambra, and then uh, there's skunks over by Elac, and there's some of the hills also have coyotes. And if you go too close to Pasadena, there's mountain lion, stuff like that. So good understanding. Interest, you want people interested in your subject. So let's go grab something off the thing. Um, those goggles is what I use as a kind of joke, but I would teach with those goggles, uh, how, to people, how to teach people how to ski. And so maybe I want people to be more skiers, get out there in the snow. I think everyone needs to go into the snow eventually. You don't have to ski, but you have to get to the snow. Um, because your the ability to adapt in different weather is an important trait. So I want people interested in maybe snow sports or visiting cold places. Because I think the importance of, you know, being able to survive the elements. And then finally, you want people to remember. So... Science. Uh, I, I have this microscope there because of my love of science. And I want people to remember the basic fundamentals of science. If I was talking about the history of science, like the importance of the scientific method, how, how it's used in not just medicine, but also in biological research, engineering, um, computer science, all the sciences have used the scientific method in some way or another. And so I want that remembered because all these people who are going on the conspiracy theories forget the basic principles of, you know, science and, 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 and research and so forth. All right. So those are the goals, right? I gave you practical examples. All right. Clarify with the word picture. I already talked about it. Go out through their senses. Such a primal analytic connection, basic connection to your brain. So if you were able to say something that triggers a response with their senses, meaning that they go, mm, I would like to taste that um, tacos they were talking about in the informative speech. That's a, that's a good response, all right? Um, maintain audience attention. There's a bunch of ways to do it. 
look in your book, but have conflict. So if you're giving a speech about history, you're talking about, um, or actually conflict of, uh, yeah, his history speech um, and so forth, you would talk about um, maybe a great war or something like that. So you, you build up con the conflict that led to the war. Uh, action, um, sports speeches, right? You know, like this is, not many people know about one of the sports I played, which I have the ball over there. I'm not going to go grab it, but I played water polo in high school and I'll still train with that ball on occasion because uh, I love water polo. And, um, and people don't know that it's probably one of the, if not the hardest sport there is. And people don't know it's considered a three dimensional sport because not only are you, you, you're playing on your whole body. In, in, in so many different ways on all the level, level of water, underneath the water, and so forth. So, and so, the, you know, you talk about the action, the suspense, you know, like discovery, you know, you're talking about, you know, some kind of, you know, new um, trend in your speech. And uh, will this business succeed? And so forth. You build it up. And then finally, humor, humorous examples and so forth. I, I, beginning speakers i try to stay away from humor because you run into people who will go over like bad dad jokes relate to listeners this is something from your book but i talk about it a lot and just like word picture hint hint nudge nudge uh this is going to be on the test it will definitely be on the test so and this is something not only for informative but also for your persuasion Relate to listeners by going after their self-interest. What I mean by that is everyone is basically selfish in nature. That's not a negative thing. It's a survival factor. When you're hungry, you go for food because you want to eat so you don't, you know, pass out because of lack of nutrition or something, right? Being selfish is a basic survival factor, right? Selfishness is a bad thing. Being overly selfish where you are hurting people, that's a bad thing. But basic selfish... And, and and I can't say enough, everyone in history has been selfish in some way. And if you have questions about that, you can talk to me. If you can, like, like, what about this person? Selfish. Everyone's selfish in nature. And so that might be on, that That will definitely be on the test. Like either, uh, what is the characteristic that your professor says everyone has? Selfish. Or so I'm selfish. And then, or what's, what, uh, what is the thing that goes, is the best way to relate to listeners? relate to their, you know, self-interest. Because the fact of the matter is, if you can get people interested because they have a stake in it, then they're more likely to listen. So if I'm giving a speech about anything and I relate to you, students, about how to make college cheaper, you'll be more likely to listen. Or, you know, how to graduate or for you seniors, summer jobs, you know, for when you're on, on your own. Um, these are things that uh, you will be more interested in because of your, you know, your demographics, right? So keep that in mind. Um, enhance audience recall. Uh, your book covers them, but a, a lot of ideas, uh, a lot of things, just basic stuff, reinforcing the ideas. Um, if you have a good declarative statement for your thesis, and then why, when you're going through your main points, it goes back to your thesis, it reiterates your thesis uh, without saying it over and over again. That's a good way to reinforce your ideas, um, to support it with, you know, the good research or supported by a good structure in your speech. That reinforces ideas. It's easy to follow. Reinforcing ideas in so many different things. And then there's verbal, nonverbal. Verbal, you know, your speech and your delivery. Nonverbal, obviously, is your PowerPoint or maybe how you dress for the occasion or your non, you know, hand signals. So lots of different ways. This is stuff that you would find through practice. Practice, practice. All right. There's usually questions. As always, when I do the chapters, uh, you have questions, write them down. And then when we go come into class, you know, and so forth. Let's keep going. Brains. All right. Uh, chapters eight and nine. Let's see how far do I get? Uh, I gotta get pretty far. Um, I don't think I can get that far. Uh, we'll go to eight and nine. 
Uh, brainstorm uh, eight chapter eight and nine goes over uh, uh, gathering. So uh, this this is the part part three. We're getting the part three, um, which is the part that we skipped um, for the first half of the class. Um, part is like uh, organizing, putting together your speech. Uh, now I have to grab this so you can enjoy more. All right, here we go. Chapters eight and nine. Uh, chapter eight is uh, developing your speech. Chapter nine is um, gathering supporting material. All right. Um, organizing your speech, brainstorming. We've done we've done brainstorming in class and so forth. Uh, general purpose, specific purpose, central idea, main ideas. Remember, I told you that there will be terms from the first half that are repeated. So while the final is not a um, covers the whole semester, only covers the second half of the semester. There are sometimes like credibility and general purpose are repeated, and they can be on the final, even though they're. Uh, introduced in the first part. If they're repeated again, that makes them eligible for the final. And the one that you need to care about the most is general purpose. General purpose is, again, you're, you're either doing an informative speech, a persuasion speech, or an entertainment speech. Those are the big, those are the three general purposes and the ones that we cover in this class. Uh, specific purpose is like when you start implementing your thesis and your main points into that general purpose, right? I'm doing an informative speech about um, 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 uh, what is, I'm trying to think about a trend right now uh, that's popular. Um, I'm so old, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so anyways, you're, you're like doing an informative speech of about you know exercising or something like that so that's where you get into the specific purpose central idea thesis theme main ideas the main points a blueprint is is essentially your outline uh, but it's also your references as well um it's a blueprint on how you're going to you know plan out your speech how you're going to study lots of different things can be the blueprint Vertical search engine, and now we're getting into the terms from chapter nine. Vertical search engine is Google, uh, Google and so forth. I always tell students about the fact that before Google, the most popular search engine was Yahoo. Yahoo's still around, but they were so big that they at one point could have bought Google. They're like, no, 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 Google's not a threat to us. <laughs> Whoops. Um, but yeah, Yahoo used to be the big dog. Just like Blockbuster, Blockbuster um, video store could have bought Netflix and Blockbuster could have bought Redbox at one point. Now there's only one Blockbuster, it's in like Oregon or something. So, um, but anyways, and also just real quick on the Yahoo thing. Uh, before Google, searches used to be uh, done by webs, you know, going through the websites and seeing what word is repeated the most. Except web designers figured that out. And so like at one point, the number one or number two search for Disneyland in the old days was a, a website about a serial killer because the person who made that website repeated the word Disneyland over and over again in the background and the lettering and the background color was put the same. And so, yeah, so they, Google changed the way all search engines work. And yeah, vertical search engine. The best example is Google. Domain, domain is the last three letters. And we'll talk about that more in a second. Domain, dot com, dot net, dot o -O -R -G, dot g o v dot e d u. Those are domain names. And there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, every country has one. And the countries that have the least regulations are the ones that are usually sponsoring are the places where people are putting those privacy sites up. Uh, online databases, your library and so forth, we'll cover that more when we get to the research workshop. Uh, stacks, the stacks are the shelves in the library pretty much. Okay? And there's also the stacks of newspapers and so forth. 
and magazines by celebrity bookshelves. Preliminary biography, bibliography, that's the thing in the back of your rough draft that you need to have, the, your sources site. And citation manager, we're going to cover that more um, when we do the uh, research workshop, but just FYI, it is, um, it's a nice little theme tool with your citation. Um, again, if you have questions on the term, save them for when we meet. Uh, consideration. In your book, it talks about the three things that you need to consider, your audience, occasion, and yourself. Uh, remember that you got to consider who you're talking to. Your audience for your, your speeches is fellow students, but sometimes that audience could be teachers, adult, uh, community members, uh, professionals, so forth. The occasion changes because like your occasion is the fact that you're all trying to get great. That's not a big problem. But you know, on entertainment speeches, your the occasion dictates the speech. If you're there to toast or roast somebody, that obviously dictates a speech. If it's a eulogy or graduation or whatever, the occasion really dictates a lot of the speech. And then finally, yourself, whether or not you can do it. The fact is, first off, you guys have already done your first speech, so you know you can do it already, so you're good to go. And then the other thing about if you have the ability to is you're in a classroom. You're in a classroom with fellow uh, uh, speakers who are trying to also get a grade. So you do have the ability to do it. But at the same time, I know maybe a couple of you think you might be good. It might be, you know, debate team material. But at the same time, we have like national political conventions. And I don't know if anyone's up to putting themselves on, you know, on TV, giving me, you know, a speech for the Republican or Democratic convention where millions of people are watching and it will be reported on. I don't think anyone's at that level yet, but you can see how if you have the ability to is also part of the consideration. So keep that in mind. Everyone in this class has the ability to do a, a simple public speech. No problem there. All right, general purpose versus specific purpose. Remember, when you see the verses, it's because I want you to make sure to keep them separate. And the reason why I change it with the verses, because it used to be an and. Uh, the reason why I changed it to a verse is, is students, especially on the affirmative speech, get into persuasion type stuff, judgmental language, telling you to do stuff, stuff like that. You know, when you're saying benefits of something, you know, that's that's not that's not informative. Pro-con speeches, which are not allowed in the class, uh, or cost-benefit analysis speeches, which also is not allowed in the class, because that's high school, junior high stuff. <clears throat> um, but they're also naturally judgmental. You know, that, that's judgmental language. So obviously you can never do those for a formative, right? And so, but students will be using persuasion. So, and, and they'll forget about the general purpose, whether it's persuasion, informative, or entertainment. So by keeping them separate, you always remember, no matter how much you like the specific purpose, whether you're talking about yoga, Mexican food, uh, civil war, uh, dogs, um, history of rockabilly music in East LA, you are, no matter what that subject is, no matter how much you love it or like it, you still have to remain informative, unbiased, and neutral. So that's why you keep it separate. So you don't forget the, the, the general purpose. Uh, central main idea though, coordinate, work together, your thesis, your main points, they have to work together or at the function. Especially if you're doing topical, that natural flow. Whew. Just going through these without you guys giving me feedback is so annoying. I like hearing and stopping to talk to you guys. Um, all right, uh, keep it going. Um, by the way, if I ever talk about student speeches from the past, unless it's extreme situations, I always have permission of students. So you never have to worry about me talking about your speech of the future. Right, unless it's an extreme situation, which I haven't had in like a couple of years. I mean, I haven't had a extreme yeah, in a couple of years, maybe a couple of semesters. I'm trying to remember. Uh, what I mean by extreme 
uh, situation is that something extreme happened and I did not ask the student leadership. You'll hear about one of those speeches soon. Uh, but even then, I don't talk about who it was. You know, I'll give you specific information. But you just need to know that you don't have to worry about your speeches being talked about. Um, all right, so they work together, Central and Maine. All right, we're going to chapter nine now, the internet. A lot of this stuff is going to be covered in the research workshop. But just to let you know, the internet, there's first step versus credible sites. First steps are things like Wikipedia and just simple Google searches. Wikipedia is never citable. Even if you go and click on the reference below, those references don't always work. Those references might get you blocked or the references can be faulty. So you can never trust it. So all parts of Wikipedia, but Wikipedia is great though. I use Wikipedia all the time. And the best thing about Wikipedia is it usually confirms information you know. And so you can look it up and go, okay, now when I do my credible searches, I know some information already. So it, it just it just confirms information you know. And then Google searches, they're really great for brainstorming, but a lot of times those first searches don't get you to credible websites. And we'll talk about that more. Credible websites are your newspapers, your news sites, um, government organizations that are, you know, have a consistent track history and so forth. The best source of credible sites is, of course, library databases by far. Library databases eliminates bias and false sources. Um, so let's go over evaluate, how do you evaluate what's a credible website or credible source. First off, the domain. The domain is a really good thing to know. So um, a good example of this is there's five domain, the five there's five domains that are considered the main domains: dot com, dot net, dot gov, dot edu, dot org. Those are the five uh, main ones. Um, out of those, by the way, hint hint nudge nudge. Out of those five, the most credible of the five is dot com because it's the oldest of the five. And so most websites paid good money, either they started out with it or they paid good money for it to get the .com. And that's why some of the newest companies have weird names because um, they either weren't taken or the person who had, oh, excuse me, the .com, they didn't cost that much to get it. And so that's why some of these places have weird names. Um, I remember when business.com was up for sale and at the time it was like, it was, it was like a big thing, how much it went for in Orange and so forth at the time. Uh, so domain.com number one, the, the least, uh, least credible hint, hint, nudge, nudge of the big five is .net because it's the youngest of the five. And unlike .gov, .edu, .org, it's not directly connected to credible, usual credible sources, government agencies, education agencies, or, or nonprofit organizations. So .net is considered the least uh, reliable of the big five. Uh, accuracy, who's the most consistent? I mean, there's a lot of big name sources like Washington Post and New York Times that gets things wrong. The Iraq invasion is a good example with the New York Times, but consistently they usually have a, an excellent track record. Uh, same thing with the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, um, even sites that get a lot of grief, uh, CNN, for example, still usually are consistent in accuracy and so forth. There's a lot of other ones as well, uh, but we'll cover that more in the research workshop. Objectivity. What is their purpose? So like the Wall Street Journal is a good example. Wall Street Journal, especially on the editorial page, tends to be right-leaning, right? It tends to be on the right. But the news side of it and the overall, I mean, it's owned by Rupert Murdoch, but it still has a great reputation because of its history and its dedication to being objective. Even though the editors are on the right, 
it's still going out there and doing its job and so forth. And it has a good uh, factor. But you get another site like Fox News that is not only on the right, but they say they're on the right and they consistently show that they're pushing an agenda or a few. And that is that is when you can tell. And there's things on the left that there's that we're on the left, or, you know, pushing an agenda. Uh, but dedicated media tends to be more on the right, just FYI. So uh, if they are saying that they are there to advocate a viewpoint, then they're not objective. Uh, online database of traditional sources and interviews. We're going to cover that more later. All right, I'm going to I'm going to end it now because I don't I don't know how long it's been. It's probably been a bit, and I really don't want to start the next chapters. Yeah, I don't want to start it. Uh, we'll do that in class, and hopefully we'll catch up with the other classes because our spring breaks are different. So all right, uh, we're. We're good, good to go. Uh, I'll see you in uh, uh, the next class. Let's see, stop share. Oh, hey, up close. Um, I think that's everything.